Jag har kikat lite på mina notor och de är på dans. Och dans är svenskt, det är väldigt nära liksom. Och då blir det svårt. Därför är det någon som inte förstår engelska. Nej, det var inte det. Jag kommer att prata på engelska. Tack. Därför att eh, annars går det inte att växla om det som jag har skrivit där. Dans till svenskt är för nära på något sätt. Ja. In any case, thank you very much for showing up. Thank you for inviting me to come here. Andreas was the, the, the power behind this. And uh, I, I only know Andreas for quite a short time because he flew in my competition in Spain last summer. But then he stopped flying in my competition in Spain last summer because he had some other things he needed to attend me to. <laughs> So I, I didn't get to know Andreas very much, but then he was kind enough to invite me to come here, and I appreciate that. That's very kind. So maybe one of the reasons why I tend to get invited to come places and speak in front of groups and clubs like your, yours is because I wrote this book. It's called Flying Rags for Glory, the A to Z of competition paragliding. And obviously competition paragliding is what I do. It's 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 what defines me as a person, basically. It's, it's, it's what I've been doing for the last 20 years, 19 years anyway. And uh, the lectures that I usually hold in front of groups like your own are uh, about competition paragliding. But because this group is not really a competition paraglider pilot group, it's going to be much more than just about competition paragliding. It's going to be about getting the most, initially getting the most out of every day out flying. But then if you take that knowledge and apply it to the rest of your life, it's actually going to be about getting the best out of every day because it's the same. It doesn't really, there isn't a rule about getting the best out of your paragliding day that does not apply to getting the best out of your day where you don't go paragliding. So if you, if you want and if, if you don't mind it getting a little lofty and, and, and uh, high-headed, then it could be just about getting the best out of it, period. Which is kind of nice because uh, we're going to be here for a few years anyway, so we might as well get the best out of it. Now, uh, why should you listen to me talking about that? And, and the reason why I think that you might want to listen to me talking about that is because it took me a long time to work out all these things. Because I was, um, I was one of those persons who used to get the worst out of most of it. And uh, aside from not being very entertaining in the long run for myself, I probably wasn't much entertaining for my surroundings either. And, uh, and uh, basically, if you think that the day is going to be shy, it is definitely going to be shy. Yeah. And that's how I felt for a very long time. And uh, the, the other side to that is that if you think that uh, everybody else around you is such a brilliant paraglider pilot and they're so good at, at flying competitions, then it is going to be very, very difficult to win over these people in the long run. And basically, when we speak about competition paragliding, the objective in the long run is obviously to win. And if you think that everybody else is better than you, then you're not going to win and then you're not going to reach the objective. So everybody's, everything is linked in, in this way that, that uh, your life becomes very boring if you think that your life is going to be very boring. And, uh, and, and your competition <laughs> career is not really going to take off if you think that everybody else is better than you. And that took me a long time to work out because I was spending most of my time maybe not so much thinking about how much better the others were to, as just about how, how miserable everything was. And uh, that meant that it took me a long time to actually start winning anything. And I had been flying competitions for more than 10 years before I started winning anything. So you might say he's a persistent bugger, if anything, because uh, who keeps doing something for 10 years if you keep getting knocked down? But uh, I was at, at some stage, at some level, probably having fun anyway. And, and uh, 
the other thing about it was that it, it seemed like a, I think what happens often is that if, if we're not sure which way to go in life, then if something presents itself that, uh, itself that seems like a good idea and that can keep all the questions off your back a little bit, then we might just pursue that direction. And I think that was what happened a lot for me. Uh, when, I, when I first left school, I didn't know what to do. And I was traveling with my backpack a lot around the world and just moving around looking at things. And I wasn't actually having so much fun doing that because you get very lonely with a backpack if you're not very good at meeting new people. And I, I was not very good at meeting new people. So I was not having much fun, but what it did was if people were asking me, so what do you do in life? Well, I travel. That's what I do. I travel. <laughs> That's what I did. And then afterwards, I discovered this competition paragliding, and, and it, people would ask me, so what do you do in life? Well, I'm a, I'm a competition paraglider pilot. And it was probably just a combination of some persistence and also this convenience about being able to actually say that you, you do do something in life, although it isn't a career as such, uh, that, that meant that I kept at it for so long, even without having any, any particular success at it. So... Uh, it gave me the opportunity to think about why people around me who had less skills at what we were doing than me were actually having more success at what we were doing than me. And that is what I hope makes me a little bit interesting for you to listen to. Because if you just walk into a new pastime and excel at it from the start, then it's very difficult for you to tell other people how to do it, because you just do it. It's intuitive for you. It's easy. Whereas for me, it took 10 years. So I had to think really hard about what they were doing right that I was doing wrong, and hopefully I can try to give that a little bit to you. And as I said, it doesn't just apply to paragliding. Now, uh, there's going to be an awful lot of talk from this side in the next hour or, or couple of hours, depending on uh, how soon we get tired of me. Uh, but I appreciate it if you shoot at me and just make comments and things so that, we, so that it, it becomes more dynamic than just me talking here. And uh, we're looking around this room, Normally when I stand up in front of a group like you, I tell them, yeah, I've been flying since 1987, and people go, wow. But then I look around this room, and I see a lot of people who've been flying since 1987, or thereabouts, because I've known most of you, or quite a few of you since then. So, so uh, that, that makes it a little bit different in this case. But people who I've met all along these years, and who have comments, Please do make these comments and just shoot because it becomes more interesting for everybody that way. Nicholas, I thought he was living in Malta for some reason. Switched Much nicer anyway. Yeah. So, um, yeah, let me just. Uh, so, in order to become good at something, what I worked out, the first thing you have to start believing is that you are good at it, or that you can become good at it. It's the first premise that you really need to have sorted before you can ever become good at something. Then the second one that's almost as important as that is you must think it's fun to do. Uh, I, I like the example of... Um, in, in, in the larger town close to where I live, there's a lot of shops owned by rich wives, as I like to call them. They are, are, are women married to successful men. They live in the right neighborhood in that town, and they get bored because they don't have anything to do. And then they think, I'm going to open a shop that sells all the beautiful things that I love so much. And uh, it's going to be some clothes and some boots and shoes, and then it's going to be little things that you have in your home and, and uh, some art. And it's going to be so beautiful, and I'm going to be in there all day, and I'm going to be surrounded by beautiful things, and I get to buy all the beautiful things at retail, at, 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 at wholesale myself for my own home, and it's going to be so great. 
And quite often, these shops don't last very long because there's more to being a successful retail person than just loving beautiful things. You have to actually love to be a retail person. And being a retail person entails talking to customers that are difficult and that come back with something that broke because you dropped it on the floor or something like that. And most of these women, I don't think this, this, uh, this perspective on retailing dawns on them before they've been in that shop for a few months. They think that it's all about just shopping for the most beautiful things and then uh, being surrounded by beautiful things all, all the time. And that means that the passion that should carry the success of the shop is actually a passion for something complete, completely different to the passion for retail. Because if you want to be successful at retail, that is what you need to have passion for. So it doesn't work. And then they shut the shop and uh, husband lost a few hundred thousand or a couple of million because they had to sell all of the, uh, all of the stock. And, and it doesn't matter much because they had fun doing it and they uh, filled the basement in the big villa in the right neighborhood with, with uh, beautiful things. And, but anyway, <laughs> the point I'm trying to make here is that you want to have passion for what you do and it should be the actual thing that you do. Now paragliding has a fair share of people who have a lot of passion for the idea of paragliding. They have passion for the idea of launching and flying above the clouds and, and, and being up there in the sky and all of that. But when it comes to the actual flying and it starts to get turbulent and you start to get collapses and, and uh, it's cold and, and miserable, then uh, it turns out that the passion is actually for an idea rather than for the real thing. And if that's your passion, then you're never going to be very good at paragliding. You can be very good at sitting on, on the landing afterwards and talking about paragliding a lot and talking about how great it's going to be next time. But the actual flying bit is never going to be the thing. And uh, if, you, if you meet... If you meet successful competition paraglider pilots, you will see that they actually have passion for the actual flying. They enjoy it even when it's not so great, even when it's turbulent, even when it's a bit of a battle with the elements. It's still fun, it's still rewarding, it's still great. So that's one of the really important things that, that one needs to realize if one wants to get very good at, at, at this game. You have to actually love doing it even on the days where it's not that great. And, and a competition, competitions are fun in that way because they happen on set dates. That means that uh, we can't just choose the good days. Often we get to choose the, the pretty mediocre days or even the bad days. And we still have to get the most out of these days. And that means that you have to actually enjoy getting the most out of any flying day and not just getting the most out of the great flying days. So that's a good, uh, a good lesson in, in, in life skills in a way that you, you need to get everything out of every day and not just everything out of the good days. Now, uh, it, the third thing that we need in order to become good at this game and probably at, at any game in reality is that we have to relish letting go of conscious decision making. I'm going to come back to this a little bit later, but paragliding is so much about intuition and subconscious or unconscious or non-conscious decision making that if you're the kind of person who doesn't like to be able to afterwards rationalize every single step of the way and say, I did this because, and then I did this because, and then I did this because, then it's going to be really difficult for you. So if you're the kind of person who really prefers to have full control and full conscious control all the way, then paragliding is going to be really hard because paragliding is so much about just actually leaning back and just letting it all happen and letting the body do whatever it takes. So, three things now. Believe that we are good or believe that we can become good. 
and having fun doing it and be able to let go of this rational Western civilization sort of mindset where you have to where you think that you have to be in control all the time and then to actually think that, that it is stimulating to, to just let go and let intuition take over and see where that leads and only when you reach that, uh, that point can you start having, uh, having a lot of success in it. And I think that that goes for pretty much anything, but it, it is particularly important in Paraguay. Let me just scroll down a little bit here so I can keep track of what I'm telling you guys. Um, my day job for the last 10 years has been uh, for UP Paragliders. It's a German-based company that's owned by a Swedish person. Many of the old people here may have met Christian running in the old days. He used to run a paragliding school in Hong Kong, and then he moved to Garmisch Partenkirchen in Germany And when he bought UP, and he's been uh, running UP since 2000, I think. And I joined UP in 2003. And my job there is um, communications, basically. So anything you've read about a UP product for the last 10 years was probably written by me. And uh, that means uh, commercial texts, but it also means handbooks and manuals and, and uh, web texts and news on the website and all of that. That's only a small part of it. Then I'm also um, managing the international distributor network, meaning that I'm the one who's in touch with all the international distributors. Not that I take their orders because I don't. The orders are, are, are handled from one person in, in, in Garmisch. But when people want to talk about things, when they have questions and things like that, it's me. And I also visit them. I go out and say, hi, how are you doing? And we bond a little bit more and we build relationships like that. And then generally I get to fly a competition when I'm there. Because I time it so that there's a competition on at the same time. And uh, I also manage the website. And it's just a part-time job. Uh, other than that, I do a lot of other things like organizing competitions like the Nordic Open, for example. Hey. Uh, so so that's, uh, that's what I do. And uh, up until the summer of 2011, I was doing a lot of competitions all around the world. Uh, after the World Championships in 2011, the wing that I was flying was suddenly not allowed anymore. And, and now I don't actually have a competition wing as such to fly anymore. So that means I'm not flying so many competitions as I used to be. And um, I miss it a lot. So uh, that's one of the reasons why I've just recently, about a month ago, taken the initiative to revive the competition wing class and the open class for competition paragliders. And I'm making a tour of uh, three events this year and four, uh, five or six events next year of, uh, that, that looks a lot like the Paragliding World Cup did in the old days. And it's, uh, it's open to all wings. It's not just open to serial class or, or certified wings. You can basically fly whatever you want. And you just show up and say, I have this wing, and I think I'm good enough to fly it. And if you say so, then I'm happy to let you fly in my box. So that's a big, bit of a step back in, 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 into the old days of paragliding. And it's a, it's a political step as well as, as just a, a, a passion step, because it's something that's necessary. Anyway, but this is not going to be about that. That's what I do. And uh, I also manage the team activities at UP, but there aren't any team activities really at the moment because we don't have a competition wing, so we don't really have a team. And that means that that side of it is, is a lot less uh, time consuming at the moment. Anyway, so when I joined UP in 2003, I got. Uh, I hadn't been flying competition much for the last couple of years and uh, I, I got right back into it and I got one of the UP competition wings and um, it didn't take so long before the results started to tick in. I was uh, in Brazil for the Brazilian championships in, in 2006 
and, and I was the only foreigner there, there were nobody else, and there, there's some quite strong pilots in Brazil, and most of them didn't really know me, they did, there's a Danish guy here, and what's he doing here, and uh, I won the competition, and uh, that was one of the first successes of my sort of second life in the competition scene. And, and after that, I've, uh, I've been winning quite a lot. I've been winning the, the British Championships, a uh, couple of comps even, and um, uh, Nordic Championships and the US Championships and, and, and things like that. So uh, that was when I thought, when, when I realized that I'd started winning, that was when I thought, hey, you've probably got another, enough stuff inside your head now that you can probably share it with people out there and that's when I wrote this book and then because I realized the market for such a book is quite small I put in a whole section about the history of competition paragliding because I've lived it all <laughs> and uh, I thought that would be fun to read for maybe some of the other people who, who have been part of it for some of the way and I was hoping that that would increase the readership a little bit. Don't know if it has, nobody's commented much on that, but anyway, it's there. And, and Could I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, you, you stated that, that uh, it's uh, how your attitude is. Yes. When you started winning, did you realize at that moment that it was your attitude that uh, made you win? It was, on my part, it was a conscious decision because I'd, I'd lived through a period where I had been very negative in my, my mind, basically. I thought that everything was shit and the weather was, was always crap and it was never going to be good. And I realized that that was what separated me from some of the others who were actually winning. It was that I was thinking negative and they were not. And I made the conscious decision to just stop basically, and start thinking, hey, you can do this, and, and it's going to be good. And, and what I do now is, because I think we all, we've all been to launches where there's a group of pilots sitting on their paraglider bags, they're sitting there and they're looking up and they're saying, oh, it's looking short. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it's looking dangerous, basically, that's what it is. It's not just looking shit, it's looking dangerous. And... Um, that actually tends to spread. It pervades a launch. If there's a group sitting there uh, and, 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 and speaking and having that attitude, then it spreads in, in larger and larger circles. And I just decided I was not going to be part of that anymore. I was just going to walk away, sit with my back to the group, put some music in my ears so I couldn't hear it anymore, and just think about what a great flight I was going to have. And that's when it started working, basically. And what I do now is, when, when I'm at a competition or when I'm out flying, then from the very start of every morning, I just decide today is going to be great. It is going to be great because I'm here, I'm here to fly. So that leads to the obvious conclusion that it is going to be great. And that means that no matter how the conditions look, if I get taken up to launch, it means that somebody in the organization thinks that we're going to fly today, so I'm going to think that we're going to fly today, and, I, and I'm going to think that we're going to fly great today, it's going to be fun. So I don't actually look at conditions, I don't look at weather forecasts, I don't look at anything like that when I'm out in a competition, because at the end of the day, the weather forecasts is, is for me at least only going to confuse me anyway. If it's too good, then I'm going to fly too aggressive. And if it's too bad, then I'm going to fly too conservative. And, and if it's right on, on spot, then I should probably be pushing harder anyway because it's, uh, it's, it's important to be pushing. So, so the weather forecast, for example, just doesn't do anything for me. I don't even look at it. I look at the sky and uh, I, I, I make myself ready, when I get to launch I make myself ready, I unpack my things, everything's ready and I get my uh, instruments out and I'm ready to put in the task and then I put in the task and I still don't really look at conditions because it doesn't matter. If somebody says the window is open, then it's going to be great. 
it's going to be a fantastic day. And uh, if I spend too much time thinking beforehand about all the reasons why it might not be a great day, and there's always plenty of reasons why it might not be a great day, then I put my mind in the wrong uh, mindset to actually be able to get the most out of that day. And uh, I've, I've worked out that for safety reasons, it's plenty early enough to make that final decision about launching or not. When you stand on launch, you have your risers in your hand, you have your brakes in, the, in, in your hand, and then you actually look over your shoulder, and go, nah. <laughs> and then you just pack up again, and nobody has lost anything. Okay, so you might have lost one packing of a paraglider without getting a flight, but that doesn't matter in the long run. It's, the, it's only then that I decide that the day is not safe to fly. Because if I start thinking about the day not being safe to fly already on the way up to launch, then my mind starts losing it. I get in the wrong mindset, in the wrong frame of mind. I start thinking about, oh, but there's going to be turbulence over there, and it's going to be really hard to get off the launch, and it's going to be hard to get to the, that first turn point. And that's not where I want to be when I want to be good at something. I want to think that everything is possible and that everything is going to be good. So I just decided, it's very simple really, it's just a decision you make, it's going to be great. End of story basically. I could stop here and walk away and that's, that's the, the essence of, 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 of my talk, but I'll pin it up a little bit. Um, and, and for safety, as I said, it's plenty early enough when you're standing there and just look over your shoulder and you go, nah, you back up. That's all you really need. And that applies to free flying as well, of course. If you've decided to take the day off, either work or family or other obliga obligations, you might as well do it with the knowledge that it's going to be great. Obviously, when it's free flying, Unless you're uh, a very recently certified pilot and you're very, very keen, then you've probably got clues that point in the direction that it's going to be great because otherwise you wouldn't have taken the day off. But in, in competition flying in, in particular, uh, we need to be able to get the most even out of the, the, the bad days and that's why it is going to be great. Precis på poängen där. Det är ofta när du tar upp svenska. Ja, det är ofta man kommer till som fritägare då. Kommer till ett ställe utanför Sverige och säger vi. Så kan det sitta en grupp människor där som inte är sugna på att flyga. Ja. Och så förstår man inte. Det ser jättebra ut. Det gäller ju bara att dra iväg och så blir det ju bra. Sen kommer den aldrig upp va? Ja. Man ska aldrig lita på en lucka. <laughs>